can upload it on after the fact. Well, you were able to do it on Sunday, so. Good evening and welcome to HCC Heartbeat. I'm Pastor Wendy and um, Pastor Micah was going to teach tonight but he got detained at work. Figures, right? So one of my things this year and for the last probably 18 months is God's got me stuck on the word overflow. And so we're going to talk about overflow tonight. One of my favorite examples has been plastered all over Facebook. If you're holding a cup of coffee and somebody comes along and bumps or shakes your arm, making you spill your coffee everywhere, why did you spill your coffee? And you say, because somebody bumped into me. But that's not the right answer. You spilled coffee because coffee is what is in your cup. Had there been tea in your cup, you would have spilled tea. Whatever is inside your cup is what will spill out. Therefore, when life comes along and shakes you, and it will happen, whatever is inside you will come out. It's easy to fake it until you get rattled. So we have to ask ourselves, what's in my cup? When life gets tough, what spills over? Is it joy, gratefulness, peace, and humility? Or is it anger, bitterness, harsh words, and reactions? Life provides the cup. You choose how to fill it. Tonight, I have asked Rebecca to share her thoughts on one of her favorite Bible stories, and then I will share what God has given me. Hi, I'm Rebecca, for those of you who don't know, online. Um, I am Pastor Mark and Wendy's kid. (laughs) And this thought struck me last night while I was watching YouTube in bed at 1 in the morning, and a video came across my feed that was three grown men watching VeggieTales for the first time and, uh, and reacting to it, and it just happened to be the story of Jonah. Now, I wasn't exactly paying attention to the video, trying to fall asleep. It was 1 in the morning, but the thought process still struck me because... ADHD, so on. So God probably knew that Jonah was not the best man for the job. He probably knew because he's the beginning and the end and Alpha and Omega and everything in between and just so happens to know the very amount of hairs on our head. Uh, He probably knew that Jonah was going to run away and ignore the plan that God gave him, but God still picked him. God knew that Jonah was going to run away and get into a boat of non-believers. God knew that he was going to take a nap and that he could send a storm. I mean, he had the storm ready and the fish in place, just waiting for Jonah. God was prepared for this exact circumstance. Had he not picked Jonah, he would not have had to have a fish and a storm ready. He wouldn't have had to wait longer for the message for Nineveh to be said and for their repentance. Had he not picked Jonah, he wouldn't have had to grow a tree and kill it overnight just to teach Jonah a lesson. But he did. He didn't pick someone who would have followed orders right away and gone on their merry way, happy to have helped spread the word. He picked the biblical equivalent of a reluctant man-child and used his actions to lead even more people to the Lord. Had he chosen someone else, those merchants wouldn't have gotten saved. Had he chosen someone better equipped, more ready to serve, those souls would have been lost. 
The people of Nineveh were known for being heathen, so much so that Jonah ran in the exact opposite direction because he thought they deserved to be destroyed. And yet it took Jonah walking less than a third of the city and proclaiming God's warning for them all to turn themselves around. It took Jonah walking less than a third of the city for the king of the city to declare that the city needed to repent. And we are told that they did. Without mention of question or hesitation, the entire city repented before God. And he saw this and canceled the demolition. That angered Jonah. The very man that God sent to help save the souls of the city was angry that God's plan worked, as it usually does. You have to be a different kind of bitter to be mad that people are giving their lives to the God that you trust. That kind of bitterness can destroy your soul. God saw this and used this as an opportunity to teach Jonah about mercy. In doing so, he probably saved Jonah's soul. I say probably because we're not told how Jonah reacted to the verbal gib slap that God gave him. If God had chosen someone perfect for the job, someone obedient, compassionate, etc., the souls of those merchants would have been lost. Nineveh would have, might not have actually repented, and Jonah might have died with the bitterness most foul in his soul. God does not make mistakes, and he knows us better than we know ourselves. So is it so hard to believe that he chose us for a job on purpose? Is it so hard to believe that he knew, that he knows how, we're think, how we think and react and doesn't already have a plan to use that for his purpose? Thank you, Becca. Like I said, what I'm going to share with you guys tonight, it's not new to some of you because I've shared this in the split service with the ladies. But I feel like this is something important for the body of Christ, regardless of gender. God has been pounding away at my heart with a theme of overflow for over a year. Romans 15, 13 in the Passion Translation says, Now may God, the fountain of hope, fill you to overflowing with uncontainable joy and perfect peace as you trust in him. And may the power of the Holy Spirit continually surround your life with his super abundance until you radiate with hope. Let's pray. Father God, thank you tonight for your word, for your wisdom, and for your revelation. Father, I pray tonight that you reveal your truth to us, that we can walk in a way that is not petulant, that is obedient and is with joy, Father God, that we learn to walk in the overflow, Father, of the goodness of God and that we choose you every time. In Jesus' name, amen. The beauty of a fountain is the overflow of water. A fountain without water is not nearly as pretty. And like that fountain, you were created to overflow. You were created to overflow with the refreshing waters of the Holy Spirit. That being said, the enemy likes to copy God and take it to the exact opposite. So if the overflow of God is joy, peace, and superabundance, then the enemy's forgery of that is more like a break in the sewer line, an overflow of filth, disease, misery, and stink will flow out of that, and there's nothing beautiful or brilliant in that kind of mess. The overflow of the enemy is nasty, and spiritual overflow does not come by chance. We are constantly being depleted, and our connection to God is the only long-term answer. But if you want to live in the overflow, there is a price to pay. Entering into the overflow is not cheap, and it costs you something. It will cost you obedience to God. Just like Jonah had to be obedient, and even though he did it with the stinky sewer spirit, he was obedient. After God got his attention and almost sank him in the middle of the sea. But he still did what God told him to do. 
God tells you you must God tells you what you must do so that you will begin to live in overflow. He said if you will listen diligently to the voice of the Lord your God and uh, and observe and do all that he commands, then the blessings will flow or will follow you. The blessings will be so many you'll be running from them and they will pursue you. They will overshadow you. And at that stage, you get to a level where you never borrow, but you'll be lending to the nations. It'll cost you hard work because God enlarges the boundaries of your tent. He's been doing that here at HCC. It may not, let me see, Lee's here, I apologize. Okay, that was tickling me, sorry. (laughs) It may not look like it in the number of people that are attending in the building, but we have watched the ministry of HCC reach further and further outside of the walls of the church. We're seeing it reach pastors in other countries. We have pastors in the Philippines that we're ministering to. We have pastors in Guatemala that we are ministering to. We have pastors on the other side of the continent that we are ministering to. So the influence and the ministry of HCC, God has enlarged the, the boundaries of our tent. He's enlarged our borders by our obedience. And it n- isn't always something that you can see. But that didn't come because we sat and waited on God to do it. That came because we worked hard. Overflow does not come to lazy people. Overflow is not for the slothful. It's for hard workers. Proverbs 22, 29 says, See if a man diligent in his business, he shall stand before kings and not before mean men. Your promotion is at hand, but it is going to lead you to hard work. And moving in the overflow is going to cause you to practice self-discipline. Careless people, people who cannot control themselves, cannot cope with overflow they're just not prepared to handle the abundance they cannot handle you cannot manage by chaos and deal with overflow does anybody understand the concept of managing by chaos that's when you only deal with it when it becomes a crisis you you ignore it until it becomes so chaotic that it requires your immediate attention if you can't organize and deal with things before they become uh, a crisis, you're not going to be able to handle overflow. You have to discipline yourself. If you're a list maker and you work those lists, <laughs> you got this. You can do this. So what is it? Uh, we've talked about what it's going to cost, but how do you move into overflow? So you stop looking at yourself. You move away from God bless me to Lord make me a blessing. You stop praying for yourself alone and you pray for God to, uh, and stop praying for God to bless you, make me a blessing, move away from God heal me to God heal others through me. God help me pay my rent to God make me a landlord. You move from God bless me to make me a blessing. Um. In Second Chronicles, ver- uh, chapter one, verses six through twelve, when God asked Solomon, "What do you want?" Uh, he's made the thousand burnt offering, and he asked for wisdom and understanding so he could take care of God's people. Well, that's why God gave him the wisdom and understanding. And what he didn't ask for, God added you want to enter into living in an overflow get thirsty get thirsty for God the Bible says blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness they shall be filled begin to hunger and thirst for God Elisha said when Elijah confronted him in 2nd Kings 2 verses 9 through 15 what do you want for me to do for you before I'm taken away Elisha said, I want a double portion. Do you understand 
that a little portion can do mighty things. But a double portion, when he got that double portion, even after he died, the anointing still overflowed out of his dead bones and raised a dead man. That's how much a double portion can do for you. He said, I don't want just ordinary. I want extraordinary. Extraordinary. You've got to be hungry and thirsty. You have to want that overflow and be prepared to drink it and accept that invitation. He's already offered invitation. All we have to do is accept the invitation to drink from that overflow. He said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. The invitation has been there for a very long time. He's waiting on someone who will say to him, I want that overflow. I accept that invitation. And lastly, we need to learn to provoke the overflow. Now, growing up, provoke was a bad word. Provoke meant that that, that was a negative thing because I didn't want to provoke my mama or my daddy growing up. That had bad consequences. Provoke was bad. I didn't want to provoke my sisters because that got me in trouble with mom and dad because that would provoke them too. Tumbleweed, why did that happen to me? Tumbleweed, sorry. <laughs> Joshua 3, 12 through 16 says, And as those who bore the ark came to the Jordan, and the feet of the priests who bore the ark dipped in the edge of the water, so the Jordan overflows all its banks during the whole time of harvest. They stepped. They provoked the overflow. They took that step. The Bible teaches in Psalm 23, 5, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. This scripture makes us understand that God is the source of the overflow. The overflow starts with him and floods over the sides. The word overflow means going beyond the limit, running over, to be more than enough, to fill to capacity, to be complete and super abundant. For over eight years, Pastor Mark and I have talked about the floodgates being open, making reference to the, that overflow that has been held back. It's now ready to be released. It means someone is positioning themselves to experience super abundance. We have a promise of such prosperity that it's going to be an overflow, just like Psalm 23, 5. Our cup will overflow, super abundant. In Joel 2.24, it says, The threshing floor shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. This makes reference to a season that's coming when you're not just going to have enough on your table, but your floor will be covered with excess of grain, not just to bake. It means you will have enough and also have leftovers. Our good shepherd is so awesome that he gives us green pastures not just to eat, but to lay down in. And the word we use for lying down is to retire, which means your shepherd says not only are you going to have enough to eat for each day, but you're going to have enough to retire on. You will not have to stress or struggle because the good shepherd provides for you so you have more than enough. Aren't you glad that our God is a God of more than enough? There we go. Y'all are awake. <laughs> the floodgates of joy, anointing, power are open. And there are some that have not experienced any floods of any kind. And some started in January of 2020 experience, expecting to experience these floods. And the only flood we got was out of the bathroom <laughs> and flooded the building <laughs> and we got really frustrated we were flooded with a lot of negative stuff <laughs> but it was really a positive thing God used that clean water praise God and we got practically a new building out of it for our deductible basically very little more than our deductible 
you have a parking lot that's paid for. And some people are here, you're standing here in 2021, and all they can see is the disappointment. All they saw was the water. They didn't see the reconstruction. They saw the mess, not the reconstruction. They saw the frustration, not the final victory, not the final result. They're fixated on the frustration, and they're giving up. But there are things you can do to maximize the remaining months of 2021 and live in overflow. It's absolutely possible for you to activate and stimulate the overflow. It's possible for you to have the keys that will unlock the floodgates and provoke heaven to release on your behalf. You can provoke or prevent what God is about to release to you. Let me say that again. You can provoke or prevent prevent what God is getting ready to release on your behalf. Some people have limited God from doing what he wants to do in their lives. You have the power to say and do things because because God has given you that authority. You have a responsibility and you play a part. Overflow doesn't just happen. Remember I said it doesn't come to the lazy. You have a you have work to do. And floodgates don't open for those sitting on their laurels. You have to be proactive. You have to sow. You have to stimulate your finances. You have to be a good steward with what God has given you. You have to add something to it in order to get something from it. You have to let go of what you have in order to make room for what you want. You cannot get an overflow in your hand if your hand is shut. King Solomon understood this concept. When he asked for wisdom to rule and judge the people, not wealth or fame. Just like King Solomon, you can give an offering that will provoke God to to give you not only what you asked for, but those things you did not ask for. Not only did God give King Solomon wisdom to judge the people and rule the people, he also gave him the wealth and the fame. Probably shouldn't have because Solomon went down a path. But nevertheless, that was a bonus for his heart wanting what was best for his people. Praise. If you want to get out of a bondage situation, offer praise to God. You have to put pressure on a thing for it to open for you. You can't get out that door unless you put some pressure on it to move it. not going to happen. You can stand in front of that door all day long. It's not going to move unless you put some pressure on it. Plain and simple. Your car won't move if you don't put your foot on the gas pedal and apply some pressure. If you're going to get out of a situation, you have to praise your way out. Paul and Silas put on a praise pressure in prison and the gates opened wide. When you put praise to a pressurized situation, you're causing God to move on your behalf and put your foot on it. If there's any obstruction between you and your destiny, put your foot on it. Don't underestimate the power of your feet. You can put your foot on a thing, and that thing has to shift. There is power in your foot, and you get victory over the devil by putting your foot on him. When the floodgates open to you, not everybody will be able to handle your flood. Let me say that again. When the floodgates open to you, not everybody will be able to handle your flood. There will be some that went before you that you are going to overtake And there were some that started out with you that will be left behind. Follow God anyway. Don't deny what God has for you for the sake of someone else. What you need is grace to run with patience the race that is set 
before you. You get to choose what you overflow. Are you going to be like Jonah and overflow with bitterness and walk in obedience with stomping feet and a boo-boo lip? Or are you going to be like Paul and Silas and praise your way out of prison? Are you going to be like the prophets and overflow so much of God's glory that even your dead bones raise dead people buried under the ground? Your dead carcass raises somebody that gets dropped on top of your grave? What are you going to overflow with? Life is going to bump into you. People are going to hurt you. What is going to come out of you depends on you. So my prayer for you tonight is Romans 15, 13. Now may God, the inspiration and fountain of hope, fill you to overflowing with uncontainable joy and perfect peace as you trust in him. And may the power of the Holy Spirit continually surround your life with his superabundance until you radiate with hope. Father God, thank you for this evening. Thank you for this time of sharing and our ability to meet together in a cool, bu- in a cool building where we can feel your presence, where we can freely speak your name, and where we can hear truth, Father God, even when it doesn't feel good. And Father God, if there is any um, anything less than your righteousness in me, I ask that you remove it. Show it to me so that I can dig it out. Because, Father God, I don't want to be a source of sewage. I don't want to overflow anything but your glory and your grace and your mercy. I want my words and my actions to be a source of comfort and grace and peace and praise for your name. I want to be a light. I want to be your vessel. I want to be a fountain overflowing with your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us for the HCC Heartbeat. We'll see you at 7 when Pastor Mark uh, is up here to teach our Acts Bible study. Thank you and have a good night.